You know, scary stories don't usually start on a sunny Tuesday morning, but when I sat down with my coffee today, Wizards immediately jump-scared me with 30 different cards, the most cards we've seen for preview season all season so far, and at least half of them look like they might actually be standard playable, and the other half of those look like they're definitely standard playable. So we've got a lot to talk about today. What's up, Wizards? I'm Deb from The Place. Thanks for coming by. We got dust more cards to look at, and we got a bunch of really good ones today. So let's go ahead and jump right into it. Now, despite all the hype I've just pumped into your veins, sorry about that, there are going to be cards every day that don't quite meet the measure of greatness. So let's start with some uh, stinkers here, like we usually do, and then kind of work our way up to the good stuff. There's a psychology to this, but we got to start with stuff like Acrobatic Cheerleader, Grasping Long Neck, and Piranha Fly. Now, Acrobatic Cheerleader is a cheerleader. That's... <laughs> First cheerleader in Magic? I'm pretty sure, but this is two mana, one and a white for a 2-2 human survivor with survival. So at the beginning of your second main, if it's tapped, it gets a flying counter, but this is only going to happen the one time. Okay, so that also means, by the way, I'm pretty sure that if it loses its flying counter somehow, then it can't get it back. So that's, I guess if they break its leg, it can no longer do the jumps or whatever. But yeah, this is a neat little card, but not really much more than like a 23rd card you'll sometimes play in limited because it's not even like that great there, to be honest. So I think we should probably move on to Grasping Long Neck. Reminds me of my uncle. He's always grasping for a long neck bottle. This is three mana, two and a green for a 4-2 enchantment creature, which is also a horror and it has reach. And also when it dies... You gain two life, a little death trigger. Okay, so this is a three drop that's going to trade with a bunch of two drops. However, it's not as bad as the usual fare. You know, your three mana, three twos and all that that I kind of despise in limited. This, you kind of don't mind when you trade it because you gain the life and it can take out large flyers and stuff because of the reach. Like, it's not too bad. You know, it triggers all of your eerie stuff because it's an enchantment. I mean, you'll play this every now and again, but... I probably shouldn't still be talking about it. So let's move on to Piranha Fly. Just two mana. This is one in a blue for a 2-1 fish insect with flying, and it enters tapped. So aside from the cool creature type and the nightmare fuel, there's really not much to say about this. Two mana, 2-1 flyer. Why does it enter tapped? It was already kind of baseline enough. I don't really get it, but it, it exists. Let's take a small-ish step up in quality here to look at Shepherding Spirits and Slavering Branch Snapper next. These are similar cards. Now, Spirits is six mana, four and two white for a four, five spirit with flying. It also has plain cycling too. On the other hand, Slavering Branch Snapper over here is also six mana, four and two green for a seven, six lizard with trample and four cycling too. So on the one, you get a flyer. That's kind of beefy. On the other one, you get a huge trampler. So... I'm not sure which is better. Kind of depends on which ability you like more, what board state you're on, all that stuff, whatever. So I just kind of like that they keep printing these like basic land cycling creatures for limited because they're really, really good there. But we haven't really seen one break through in standard for a good long time. And I don't think that these will either, but they're always decent cards. But a couple of cool looking lower rarity cards, to me at least, are Stay Hidden, Stay Silent, which is always going to remind me of Gandalf every time I read it. Is it secret? Is it safe? <laughs> but we also have to look at Fanatic of the Harrowing here. But Stay Hidden, Stay Silent, which is a bit of a mouthful the more I say it. It's two mana, one on a blue for an aura that enchants a creature. And when it enters, you tap the enchanted creature. It doesn't untap during its controller's untap step. So stop me if you've heard this one before. This is a blue card. But in this case, Extra Gravy. The icing here is that you can pay six mana, four and two blue and shuffle the enchanted creature into its owner's library and then manifest dread activate only as a sorcery so you can put this on one of your own guys i guess if you want to more cards that do that later i think more relevantly is that even a word <laughs> i'm not really sure but still this you i guess you can do that but the cool thing about this is that if you pay the six mana you shuffle it into I would assume your opponent's library, because that's what you put the card on in the first place. And then you manifest dread. I actually think that's really sweet, you know? It's kind of two mana for a thing that's going to get you a creature later in the game and also completely deal with that thing over there. So, I don't know. I kind of like this. You know, we often see these, like, tap-down effects that cost three mana for limited, but this one, they took a whole mana off of it, so it's actually, like, a kind of a decent cost, and eventually it takes care of the creature, like, pseudo forever, right? And it doesn't even, like, put it in their graveyard so they can do stuff with it. No, shuffle it in your library, Jack. So, I don't know. There's some cool stuff about this, but it's not 
like the most impressive card in the world, obviously. I just think it's kind of a nice piece of Rebluval, you know. But Fanatic of the Harrowing over here kind of looks like a popper version of a hostile investigator or something. It's four mana, three and a black for a human cleric, and... It's also a 2-2. I should probably point out its power toughness. It is a guy. Fanatic of the Harrowing enters the battlefield, and then each player discards a card. If you discarded a card this way, draw a card. Okay, so <laughs> you see what I mean? Like, it's not Hostile Investigator. It's not even close to Hostile Investigator, but Hostile Investigator is a mythic, and this is a common. So apparently this is exactly the gulch between those two different rarities. <laughs> <laughs> this card. So I think it's kind of cool, you know, maybe in limited or something. It's all right. I don't think you want to pay four mana for a two, two, but that's a pretty good into the battlefield trigger. So I don't know. I think it's a fine little magic card and it's cool that it kind of like lets you draw a card and get a body and put a reanimation target in the yard and they discard a card. I'm telling you, don't sleep on it. There may be more to this than there looks like there is, but you know, Probably not. So I'm going to move on to Valgavos Faithful and Patchwork Beastie here, which I always want to call Patchwork Bestie every time I read the card. But Faithful over here is a single black mana for a 1-1 human cleric. You can pay four mana, that's three and a black, and sacrifice this guy to return a creature card from your yard to the battlefield at sorcery speed. I think it's cool, man. You know I like reanimation. I just brought it up back there because I kind of can't help myself, but I'm not sure that this is good like whatsoever. It's just, it's that it's a one mana guy. Like, you go ahead and throw this down on turn one. It's unassuming. You know what I mean? But I think your opponent's probably just going to save the cut down for it and completely blow you out when you pump the four mana into it. So actually they can't do that. They, now that I'm looking at the card, they can't do that. You sacrifice it as part of the activation cost. So it's already off the table by the time it's abilities on the stack. They can't cut it down in response. Okay, that makes it a little bit better, but like still probably not actually like that great, right? So I don't have that much faith in this uh, other than to say I like the art. <laughs> but I also get to just like cards like this. Maybe there's more to it than it looks, but I'm pretty sure it's just a bunch of moths in a coat. You know what I'm saying? I don't mean that figuratively. I mean, that like literally that's what's pretty sure that's what's going on here but we'll move on to patchwork bestie i did it it's patchwork beastie a single god a single green mana for a three three artifact creature it is also a beast it has delirium see it can't attack or block unless there are four or more card types among cards in your yard but at the beginning of your upkeep you can mill a card if you like i think you can get this thing attacking on turn two <laughs> It's got, there's got to be ways, you know, like it mills a card at the beginning of your upkeep. And then if you just put three cards that turn into your yard and they're all different types, which is like never going to happen. Right. But I think that like on turn three, you could probably get this attacking like fairly easily. And at that point, it's a nice little one drop. It also fuels your delirium strategies. So there's a lot that I do like about this, man. Reminds me of like death bonnet sprout or whatever it was called. <laughs> it just rotated it, rotated out. And I used it in a lot of those like, creatures in your graveyard matters kind of decks right so i could see this kind of replacing that and kind of in a similar vein you know that card becomes a three three later on in the game and then gets larger as things go on and this is kind of much the same you know on turn three four it kind of becomes a three three and starts attacking and blocking profitably so i don't know i always liked that card but it didn't do a whole lot while it was in standard and <laughs> this probably won't either but this does have the benefit of being an artifact creature too and that might actually give it some extra relevance so I think this guy's just cool. These last few uncommons we've looked at are just cool and they may have like very niche applications in standard, but that means you could see them from time to time. Hello again, it's me. So the bad news is that we're still in the uncommons and commons and stuff like that. But the good news is that these are the ones that I've designated as good. Who am I to know that? I don't know, some guy, but these are the ones that look at least again to me like slightly better. And in some cases, much better than some of the rares we're going to look at a little bit later today. So you really want to pay attention here. We're getting into the good stuff. Here's the first couple of uncommons in this category. Clockwork Percussionist, as well as Turn Inside Out. Now, Clockwork Percussionist is a single red mana for a 1-1 artifact creature that is also a monkey toy, and it has haste. When Clockwork Percussionist dies, exile the top card of your library. You may play it until the end of your next turn. Okay, so I guess if you're looking for a good one-drop to Gleeful 
demolition away, then you found your guy right here, Boros Dex. You know what I'm saying? Like, at least might do that. I'm not going to say that this is the best Raging Goblin like ever printed, but Raging Goblin sure do keep getting better and better, man. Like this is an artifact, so it satisfies any conditions that might want you to have an artifact as early as turn one. It's a body on the table. It has it a haste, so you can go ahead and get in a couple of times if you want to before you sacrifice it. And it works in like aristocrat decks and stuff like that too, outside of just the gleeful demolition applications. Just so many cool things about this, man. It's a little bit of aggro, it's a little bit of artifact deck synergy, and it's a little bit of sacrifice synergy. So all things considered, dude, this is incredible. Even if you just like block with it or something like chump block with it and you effectively get a card, that's incredible too. And that's like the floor of the freaking thing. So yeah, man, this is easily one of the better commons of the, it's not even uncommon. This is a freaking common. And therefore is popper playable, so it's probably got some relevance in that format, but even in Standard and possibly beyond, you know, Pioneer and such, I could see a card like this actually being really, really good. We've seen cards like it in the recent past, actually, but nowhere near as good as this when you put the entire package together. This card is great. But Turn Inside Out is another good-looking red one-mana card, man. This is a single mana for an instant. Target creature gets plus three, plus zero till end of turn. When it dies this turn... Manifest Dread. Now, I've seen a lot of people play, what is it, Felonious Rage against me <laughs> on the arena lately in their little mono red decks with like Monastery Swiss Spear and Heartfire Hero and, you know, Slick Shot and oh my gosh, aren't, aren't they so cute, you know. <laughs> people love that card in that deck here recently and this is just better. This is just a better card than that card. I'm pretty sure. Like, a hundred times out of a hundred and one, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, this gives a larger power boost, which you're, like, always looking for. And it actually, like, has a chance to put a real creature out, you know what I mean? Like, same thing with Felonious Rage. You'll get a 2-2 no matter what, but in this case, you can flip it up and it becomes a slick shot. You get in, like, that's just... This is just way better, I think, than Felonious Rage. So, yeah, man, if you were playing that card before, you'll play this now. It's just a more or less strict upgrade in a lot of ways, so... Good magic card, I think, is what that equals. But there's actually still more really good cards to look at. There's Shard Mage's Rescue and Drag to the Roots here. Now, Shard Mage's Rescue is a single white mana for an aura and enchants a creature that you control specifically, and it has flash. As long as Shard Mage's Rescue entered this turn, Enchanted Creature has Hexproof. Enchanted Creature gets plus one, plus one, man. Okay, so this satisfies any whatever, like Eerie or Constellation, we used to call them. And back in the day, in the long, long ago, before even that, we called them Enchantress Effects. So, you know, anything that wants an enchantment to enter the battlefield, and there's a lot, at least in the limited environment in this set, this would be really, really good with. For a single mana, you trigger all of that stuff, and you get to save one of your dudes, and it gets even bigger. Like, let's kind of definitely go, man. Like, this is kind of a white, like, snakeskin veil in a lot of ways. And that makes it incredible, considering, again, like, unlike Snakeskin Veil, it, it, you know, enables all of those Enchantress synergies and stuff. Just like Snakeskin Veil enabled a bunch of plus one, plus one counter synergies, but it was just a good card in and of itself. This has the same thing going for it, man. I actually think that it enables more and more powerful synergies, for that matter, than a card like Veil did. So, yeah, I really like this a lot, if you can't tell. I like Drag to the Roots, too, man. It's just a good removal spell. It's four mana, two, a black, and a green for an instant with Delirium. This costs two less to cast as long as you have four or more cards of different types in your yard. Destroy target, non-land permanent. This is one of my favorite lines in all of Magic, and it's really hard to make a card like this bad. <laughs> you know, I guess it could be like six mana sorcery speed. It would be pretty terrible. But in this case, you get the classic rate. Four mana instant speed, blow up anything that you want to. But in this case, it's fairly easy to make this cost a good bit less, you know? I think that people probably still want to play Urgent Necropsy over this. And the thing about Urgent Necropsy is that Collect Evidence is kind of at odds with Delirium for like pretty obvious reasons, you know? You don't want to be taking stuff out of your yard if you're trying to get Delirium, so. With that in mind, I think Necropsy is probably the card more people are going to be on this season, but maybe this will see its day in the sun eventually. It's just a solid removal spell. 
Now, while we're in the uncommons, I might as well tell you about a couple of reprints from today that are going to be way more impactful than some of the rares we're going to see later on. So with that in mind, let's have a look at Pyroclasm and Ethereal Armor. Now, Pyroclasm, if you've never seen this card before, is two mana, one in a red for a sorcery that deals two damage to each creature and will be unbelievably relevant and standard, man. There are things, I guess, this doesn't hit, but I also don't care like at all. This is going to take out a lot of the mono red decks, a lot of the Boros decks, a lot of the green white bunnies decks kills deep cavern bats and all kinds of other stuff dude like the tokens decks that we see in standard right now this is going to bowl through them so having this as an option is great dude pyroclasm is one of the better red sweepers ever printed and it's been you know 30 years since it's been printed originally in ice age and it's still just as good and there's not a whole lot of cards from ice age you can say that about this is definitely one of them so really really happy to have this pack in standard man i can't say too much more about it because it's like self-evidently decent even in like best of three this is going to be a great sideboard piece that might make the main deck from time to time in best of one it's going to be incredible i can nearly promise you that so yeah man get ready for pyroclasm you ain't never experienced this car before you are about to it is very very good and honestly, probably, again, better than, like, 75% of the rest of the cards from today. So, if you wanted standard relevance, you got it. But there's also Ethereal Armor. Kind of low-key, one of my favorite magic cards ever printed. This is a single white mana for an aura that enchants a creature. And the enchanted creature gets plus one, plus one for each enchantment you control and has first strike. So, you get half of an all that glitters here. But it predates all the glitters by a fair number of years. Uh, but yeah, you don't get the artifacts from all the glitters, but you do pick up first strike, which is insane, considering this is usually going to give your creature like plus three, plus three at the bottom of the card. Like the floor on the card is obviously just plus one, plus one. But like you stick it on an enchantment creature that's plus two, plus two in first strike for a single white mana. And obviously at the ludicrous ends of this thing, it gives your creature like plus seven, plus seven. And it has happened lots and lots of times. I've done it myself. I love Ethereal Armor. I've played this many, many times in my life as a four of and a bunch of budget decks and stuff like way back in the day before I even had a YouTube channel. This is a great little magic card right here. So I'm not sure if it's going to be super relevant and standard. It has all the same problems that auras tend to have, but we keep seeing good like one mana auras like this, like this along with Audacity. Straight ridiculous, dude. So yes, Ethereal Armor is as good as you might think that it is, even if you think auras are kind of bad bad this is a fantastic magic card man i've experienced it a lot myself but even with all of the power that we've seen at lower rarities today there's still a couple of cards that i like more than all the others so let's take a look at inquisitive glimmer and especially fear of imposters here now inquisitive glimmer is a blue and a white for a two three enchantment creature that is also a fox glimmer that is also adorable enchantment spells you cast cost one less to cast oh boy unlock costs you pay cost one less well uh, it ain't lifelink but i'll take it you know this is kind of a jukai naturalist that they color shifted into still a very good color combination for enchantments that's pretty sweet and they just threw an extra like cost reduction effect on it i actually think that making your rooms cost less to unlock could potentially be very relevant depending on what we see in this set so that's straight up ramp right there man we've already seen with naturalist that an effect like this coming on the table on turn two allows you to cast like 17 things on on turn three i don't know how the math works out but it just seems to be what they do every time but at the very least you're gonna get two three spells on turn three you're gonna go bonkers with triggers and stuff like that so yeah just having a card like this back in standard and giving it an extra point of toughness i think it's a big deal for the enchantress decks pretty obviously just very solid card we've already seen it be a solid card for the last like three years i don't know why it'd be any different now but the card that i liked most in the uncommon slot today and there's a pretty giant ravine in what i perceive as quality between this and the other stuff and again some of the other stuff was incredible so keep that in mind is fear of imposters this is three mana one and two blue for a three two enchantment creature it's a nightmare with flash when it enters counter target spell its controller manifests dread. So I I'm going to go ahead and get this out of the way. Card could very well be a trap. You know, you're countering a spell, sure, but you're giving your opponent a creature. And it's almost never something you want to be doing, right? I guess, you know, like I've seen people call the one mana instant speed your opponent manifests dread, destroy target creature or whatever. Um, 
I've seen people call that a trap. Jim Davis called it a trap. Like yesterday when I was washing my dishes, I was watching him <laughs> do spoiler coverage of all the cards I'd already covered. And he called it a trap. And I was like, yeah, you're probably right, Jim. And he, you know, people like him might be right about this card too, but I really don't think so. I really don't. You know, this has a few things going for it, even over stuff like Spell Queller. You know, it's not Spell Queller. But this can counter any spell, which I think is at least worth noting. So if your opponent is trying to Atraxa, Itali, Breach, reanimate the Atraxa, or the Itali, whatever, whatever five, six, seven mana spell they're on right now, you can just counter it. And sure, they get a 2-2. Big whoop. They don't win the game off their spell. I like that. But even if you're just countering a Sheldred, yeah, you give them a 2-2, but they were going to have a 4-5 death touch that kills you like, just by sitting there in a lawn chair. You know what I mean? So it's just going to be much better to use this to counter like huge creatures or big spells or whatever. And you might have to sit on it and save it for a while. But even if you counter like a three drop with this, yeah, they get a 2-2, two, two, but also you get a 3-2? Like it trades with the guy that you gave them? So, like, again, big whoop, who cares? You know what I mean? But the secret mode on this, I think, is what kind of pushes it through to the other side, man, because you can target, you can, like, counter your own spells with this. And if you do that, this is essentially five power on two guys at instant speed for as little as four mana if you use like a one mana instant or something and you just like put your one mana instant on the stack counter it during your opponent's combat step and now you can just like block the shield and kill it which i think is pretty sick too but you can also just like ambush your opponent at the end of their turn if they didn't give you much to do just cast a little old spell there like two one two mana spell counter it and suddenly you got five man, five power on the table. And like the, the manifest dread guy might be a real creature you can flip over and do crazy stuff with. You get a little bit of like graveyard synergy by dropping a card in your yard from the manifest dread. Like I think that's a real like hidden mode on this card. Five power out of effectively nowhere with a steel chair is pretty sweet, dude. So don't forget that you can do that too. Countering your own spells is a real like mode or line on this card. But even if you're using it the way it's intended and you just like counter your opponent's four drop and also get a, a body like that's so good <laughs> it's just i know people are going to call this card a trap but i think there's a lot of reasons why it absolutely is not this is pretty good tempo but hey i think it's finally time to look at some rares guys we we actually made it there we can do it going up let's take a look at central elevator and promising stairs i am only clever one out of eight times i attempted now central elevator is four mana three and a blue for an enchantment which happens to be a room when you unlock this door search your library for a room card that doesn't have the same name as a room you control reveal it and then put it into your hand and shuffle up with promising stairs this half costs three mana two and a blue which bugs me why is the more expensive half on the left I don't know why, but anyway, this is two and a blue for an enchantment. At the beginning of your upkeep, surveil one. You win the game if there are eight or more different cards among unlocked rooms of doors you control. Now, I didn't realize when I first read this card that a period separates these two clauses. I thought that it was at the beginning of your upkeep, surveil one, and then you get to win the game if you meet this condition, but it actually appears as though these are separate clauses, and you just immediately win the game any time you actually meet the condition, which is pretty gonzo this is the room card i was kind of waiting for because i was hoping that there was like an actual payoff to playing like a rooms deck and this is actually kind of a better one than it might appear to be i am intrigued by like you win the game effects and especially when we finally get like a decent room payoff that actually wants you to play like a rooms deck like yeah i'm i'm kind of into it man like we'll probably play it on stream from time to time and see what happens but i don't have a whole lot of faith the deck is actually that good and for that matter, I don't really want to pay four mana for a sorcery speed tutor any room you want. Unless you already have it, don't get too cute. You know, what I mean? <laughs> like, come on, man. You could have at least let me go and get a room I already have. But I guess four mana, man. Come on, dudes. <laughs> it's just a little much. Why do I have to cast it on my turn to a four mana tutor that doesn't even... Like, it's worse than Diabolic Tutor. With Diabolic Tutor, it's four mana and I go get whatever I want. It still sucks. This is... This is just kind of bad, dude, but it does say you win the game on it, so you have to at least respect it a little bit. Maybe it's better than we think it is. Now, we got to look at three ley lines today, uh, two of them new, and then one of them not actually new, but I think it's like the best one of the three we got to see, so I'll save it for last. Let's look at the blue one here. Ley line of transformation. This is four mana, two and two blue for an enchantment. It's got the ley line text on it, so if it's in your opening hand, you just throw it onto the table to start the game. And when it enters, you choose a creature type. 
Creatures you control are the chosen type in addition to their other types. Same is true for creature spells you own and creature cards you own that aren't on the battlefield. So kind of an arcane adaptation that you don't have to pay any mana for whatsoever. A little bit lame, though. I think it's kind of not the best ley line that I've ever seen. <laughs> you know what I mean? So maybe even if you had to pay the four mana for it, just being able to say like, all right, all my guys are squirrels. And so this card works now. Like maybe there's something really tricky with it, but my brain is overheating slightly trying to figure out what the best pathway for this card would be in standard. So I'm just not too sure. But after doing some brewing, I'm sure that we can cook something up. You know, at some point we'll stream with it or something. But I'm just not really seeing the kind of consistency that you need to be like a competitive standard 1v1 deck. So I'm just kind of skipping it in my head. I'm like, ah, you're not good. But we could be pleasantly surprised by this one too if the right synergies come together. I just... Don't think so. So I'll move on to Leyline of Resonance, the red one in the set. This is four mana, two and two red for an enchantment. If it's in your opening hand, put it on the table. What are you doing? Whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell that targets only a single creature you control, copy that spell. You may choose new targets for the copy. So <laughs> I actually think that this is kind of not good while also being completely cracked in half. Like, a little bit of both at the same time. I got two wolves inside of me, man. Like, for one, there are decks, in Commander even, that are going to want this kind of effect for shenanigans, and there's all kinds of kiki-jiki-ish kind of shenanigans you can get up to with stuff like this. But these, like, Monastery Swift Spear, you know, Heartfire Hero decks and stuff... Well, they play like 12 pump spells or more, you know, they play, they play like Monstrous Rage and Might of the Meek plus some. There's also some other ones that they play. They just fill their deck with like Dreadmaw's Ires and stuff you've never heard of, you know what I mean? So like, if you start the game with this on the table as that deck, is it possible to lose? I keep thinking to myself that like if the mono red deck or the green red deck, whatever, gets this on turn one, it's done though. You know, but if they draw it on turn three, it's like the biggest pile of garbage they could possibly draw in standard. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I just, again, two minds on this one. Let me know how you feel about it, because I do, again, think that this could be really, really powerful in a deck that already exists and is already really, really, really good. So it doesn't really need too much of a push, but it might be getting one. Ultimately, I do not think that it's worth it, but, you know, we're all going to try. But Leyline of the Void is the other land line we got to see today. This is four mana, two and two black for an enchantment. And as long as it's in your opening hand, it's actually on the table. What happened? If a card would be put into an opponent's graveyard from anywhere, exile it instead. This is a reprinted ley line because they figured we are never going to make a better black ley line than the one we already made <laughs> 20 years ago or whatever. So um, let's just stick with that one. Sure, man. This is a really annoying card, man, <laughs> and a great sideboard piece. Most ley lines typically sometimes tend to be sideboard but no i wouldn't say most right but some ley lines tend to be sideboard pieces and that's definitely what we're looking at right now man just really good to have this in standard if there are any graveyard shenanigans this will further help pound them into the dirt which i guess i meant as a pun but let's look at grievous wound next one of my new favorite cards ever printed i'm serious this card's so cool dude five mana three and two black for an aura that enchants a player enchanted player can't gain life. Tough luck. Whenever Enchanted Player is dealt damage, they lose half their life rounded up. What? <laughs> what a ridiculous line of text. You're telling me if I have an Iridescent Vine Lasher out and I play a land, I ping them and they lose half their life. <laughs> what? <laughs> That's nuts, dude. Like, they take combat damage, so they take that damage, and then they also lose half their life after that. It's, come on, man. A corrupt is going to deal God knows how much damage, and then they also lose half their life. Yikes, man. So that's good. And it also works with, like, Bloodletter of Aklazots, too, for, like, the insta-kill, um, the same way the combo always has. But here you have, like, extra redundancy with Bloodletter of Aklazots. So, again, like, you even deal one damage. You kill them if you have Bloodletter out. It's just like, what a card, dude. <laughs> it's a five-minute enchantment. So this day and age, that's probably not actually good. I hate to say that. <laughs> Just it is what it is, man. It's a little bit too slow or whatever. But like in Commander, hilarious. In 2001, 
hilarious. I'm telling you, if this would have been printed in like 2001, two or whatever, it'd be an iconic card right now to this very day. Everyone would have stories about the times that they did, they have with this card and it means so much to them. But now it's printed in 24, so I'm forced to be like, it's probably too slow. But like the 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 child inside of me that still has hope and joy locked away in there somewhere is like, no, this card's great and I'm gonna play with it. So like, try and stop me. This is why I have a stream is so I can play cards like this so get ready but up next let's look at a mythic why don't we this is tyvar the pummeler it actually dropped a couple of days ago but it kind of looked like leakish so i didn't want to touch it but this is definitely an official release this is three mana one and two green for a three three legendary elf warrior tap another untapped creature you control to give tyvar indestructible till end of turn and tap him down you can also pay five mana three and two green to have creatures you control give plus x plus x till end of turn x being the greatest power among creatures that you control this guy's actually pretty slick dude like He's got regenerate, kind of. This is how they're doing regenerate nowadays. It's like indestructibility plus a tap. Um, but once he's on the table, your opponent can't just like immediately go for the throat him so long as you have any other creature out. Just like tap that creature down, indestructible tie. So I think this is actually really, really nice, dude. We don't have indestructibility on a whole lot of creatures in standard at the moment. And some of the ones that we do have indestructibility on, you have to like discard a card or whatever for and like this is just infinitely better most of the time you know some cards that require you to have other creatures on the table aren't always going to be great but i really like this all that said i really really like this card and i like the activated ability too because you know that can really help you break through late game even if you know tyvar is your biggest guy a big deal. You know, you got a couple of one ones, two twos, whatever. They all suddenly get like relatively swole relative to what they were at least. So I don't know. I like this, you know, consider the fact that in a couple of months when foundations comes out, we're going to have lawn or elves in standard. And this is not only an elf, it's a three drop. So it can come down on turn two in the very soon future here. Is that correct? <laughs> anyway, in the near future here, this is probably going to be a little bit better than it is right now. And I still think that it's very, very good right now for what that's worth. But let's take a look at Victor next. Victor Valgavos Seneschal. They've been using that word a lot. Seneschal? I don't know how I feel about it. This is three mana, one, a white, and a black for a 3-3 three, three legendary human warlock. Oh, everybody, it's an Orzov legend on Dev's channel. He's going to love it. It has eerie, so I do love it. Whenever an enchantment you control enters and whenever you fully unlock a room, surveil two if this is the first time this ability has resolved this turn. If it's the second time you've resolved this ability, each opponent discards a card if it's the third time put a creature card from your graveyard on the battlefield under your control hoss <laughs> wow <laughs> like this does three things i like <laughs> on the same card and it cares about like enchantments entering the battlefield which i also really really like we got cards like hopeless nightmare and tiny bones joins up in standard right now those are only a single mana and they both work pretty well with this you trying to make your opponent discard stuff well hopeless nightmare does that and this does that right, do you care about legends well so does tiny bones joins up and this happens to be a legend so it's good it's good there's two two ideas <laughs> right there and those are cheap enchantments so uh, the likelihood that you can actually trigger this ability more than once in a turn is relatively high in a deck like that so i think this guy's super awesome dude i don't know if he's playable i always have to like qualify things because doing this for almost a decade doing spoiler content makes you hyper aware that there's 50 percent of the player base that likes a card and 50 percent that doesn't like a card and it's just like that no matter what card we're looking at it could be like the best card ever printed there's still going to be 50% that are like, this is bad. So like, <laughs> I have to play to both sides and be objective and try to like, you know, neutrality bias this thing. And so I have to say like, it is just a three mana three, three. It doesn't have any keyword abilities. It has to wait an entire turn most of the time to actually trigger at all. Playing two enchantments a turn is harder than it seems. You know what I'm saying? So like it might only ever trigger like once a couple of times and then you, know, you get a couple of surveils for your three minute three three it's not actually that good so i'm going to acknowledge all of that while still enabling myself to be excited for magic cards you remember when you were excited for magic cards oh what can this do i'm still that guy and I, I you get back to your roots man i think you should be that guy too but listen to me telling people what they should be be yourself is what you should be or just whatever you want to be you know put the mask on it's on it's you know persona that's important but anyway 
We'll move on to Nico Light of Hope here. This is four mana, two, a white, and a blue for a mythic 3-4 legendary human wizard. When it enters, create two shard tokens. You remember those? Nope. They're enchantments with two. Sacrifice this enchantment, scry one, then draw a card. You can also pay two and tap Nico to exile a non-legendary creature you control. Shards you control become copies of it until the beginning of the next end step. Return it to the battlefield under its control at the beginning of the next end step. I wonder if you can order those triggers in such a way that the guy is still on the table. Wait, the two shards are still copies of the guy when he comes back, right? I think he can. Why wouldn't you be able to do that? I don't know. Anyway, really actually very sick card here. When this comes into play, this triggers Constellation. I always want to call it. This triggers Eerie. It's the same ability. <laughs> it triggers Eerie twice which is really, really sweet. It puts two enchantments on the table and the enchantments are really better than clues. You know, they don't trigger any artifact synergies or anything, but in terms of like what you're getting out of them, how much it costs to sack them, they are just better than clues. So we already know how good clues are. <laughs> These are incredible, but you might want to have them stick around, you know, because then they can become a copy of a thing with an ETB trigger. You blink that thing. And even though you won't get an ETB trigger off the shard tokens or anything, you will get that trigger when the guy comes back. I think it's pretty cool. And in the meantime, you can attack with a couple of like Sentinel of the Nameless Cities that were just shards the turn before. That's all so good, bro. Like, <laughs> I think this is all right, man. We're seeing a bunch of like four mana dudes in this set that put a couple of things into play. When this enters, just put a couple of things into play. And this is the next in what is becoming an increasingly long line of four drops in this set that can do that. We'll look at another one in just a second. But I think that this is a pretty sweet little card that I just... Again, here comes the qualifier. I just am not sure is actually that good in standard, but this might be one of those where if you're able to untap with it on the table and you've enabled it in any way, then it's just an absolute beast. But then again, even if you haven't enabled it and your opponent just shoots it down, you still have two shard tokens, man. You draw a couple of cards, get some scries. <laughs> it's, it's still really good. If your opponent wastes a removal spell on it, you're, you're still kind of up two cards, <laughs> you know? So, like, who cares? Just actually kind of phenomenal when you really think about it but we gotta think about other cards we have to make time for other cards so with that in mind let's look at the swarm weaver this is four mana two a black and a green for a two three legendary artifact creature which is also a scarecrow one of my favorite creature types when the swarm weaver enters create two there it is to see i was telling you create two one one black and green insect creature tokens with flying it also has delirium as long as there are four or more card types among cards in your graveyard that's what delirium means insects and spiders you control get plus one plus one and have death touch so, oh my god dude so if you're able to enable this and just have delirium the turn you play it you get a two three two 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 flying death touches come on and like you can blink this guy too like ah this dude is so good, man. Like, he puts tokens into play, too, which some decks care about more than they would care about other black four drops that you might be thinking are better than this, right? Like, some decks are going to want Sheldred. Some decks are going to want Hostile Investigator. And that's that's fine. That's that, <laughs> you know? But there are going to be still other decks that, for whatever reason, want to go wide or put tokens onto the table or put flying bodies onto the table, which neither of those other two four drops do. I actually think that this, like, anytime you're pointing out a card that, like, okay, this is a four drop creature the Golgari deck might actually play. It's hard to imagine the level of competition a four drop creature has to deal with to see play in a Golgari deck right now. But I actually think this has a chance at seriously getting a jersey in that deck, man, or at least some version of it. You know, we want to play Sheldreds, we want to play Hostile Investigators. There's even a couple of other four drops who might want to play in decks like that. But I think this is at least worth giving a try out, seeing what happens. I think this card is sneaky good. But oh boy, after that one, I need to calm down a little bit. So let's look at a couple of overlords that people say are bad. And one of them, I think they're wrong. And the other one, I think they're kind of right. Uh, Overlord of the Flood Pits is five mana. Three and two blue for a five, three enchantment creature. It's also an avatar horror. It has impending four for one and two blue. And it flies. Whenever Overlord, it flies. <laughs> Whenever Overlord of the Flood Pits enters or attacks, draw two, then discard a card. Okay. Probably not great. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> it's, it's not incredible. But I will say, just three mana, 
for draw two discard. That's not that good, but it's just, <laughs> it's kind of all right. You know, I don't think it's the worst ETB trigger, but the thing I do like about this is when it starts attacking, you also get to just cast catalog again. And then next turn when it attacks, you get to cast catalog again. It's pretty good. <laughs> It's not the worst thing I've ever seen, but I still don't think it's a particularly good version of this kind of creature in this set. No, no. Instead, the one I think is good that everyone else thinks is bad is Overlord of the Boiler Bilge. <laughs> Working translation. This is six mana, four and two red for a five, five with no real keyword abilities, but it's an enchantment creature, Avatar Horror, and it has impending four for four mana. That is two and two red. When it enters or attacks, it deals four damage to any target. So this is kind of medium. It just doesn't go in mono red, which is why I think a lot of people are saying it's bad is because it's just not like a mono red aggro card. And it's super obviously isn't. But when you start looking at what you can compare this card to, you start seeing cards like Inferno Titan and Flame Tongue Kavu. And like, those are really, really good magic cards. You know what I mean? So yeah, it doesn't like give you the body right when it comes into play if you impending it. But there is a bit of a push pull here. You know, if you have like a Koth Fire of Resistance out that's getting you mountains every turn, then well, like maybe I'll wait a couple of turns and just play the actual version of the card that has a body immediately <laughs> it's only six mana so i guess you have the option of just slamming it off the top of your library if you have the mana to do it or waiting a couple of turns but again you're big red man you're not trying to win the game fast you're trying to just win the game eventually so you know with that said this can come down on turn four blow up one of their important creatures and then suddenly you've got some inevitability going, right? I think this is one that people are like kind of sleeping on, I guess is what I'm kind of getting at here. I've seen a lot of people call this card like Greta Garbo, and I'm actually sure in some ways that it's actual Greta Garbo, who is an American treasure and not an analogy for garbage. I think the card is actually quite good. But as we round the corner on today's uh, best cards, let's take a look at the Squeakwell, everybody. It's Meat Hook Massacre. Two. <laughs> did I make you hold your breath for a second? Like, no, they did not reprint the Meat Hook Massacre. They didn't. Don't worry. Instead, we get the first ever that I can recall a sequel to a magic card. And I think it's great. I've seen some people like kind of like put off by the naming convention here. I think it's incredible, especially given the setting that we're in. So in my opinion, bravo <laughs> on the on the naming of this card. But what does it actually do? Four black mana and double X for a legendary enchantment. When it enters, each player sacrifices X creatures. Whenever a creature you control dies, you may pay three life. If you do, return that card under your control with a finality counter on it. Whenever a creature an op opponent controls dies, they may pay three life. If they don't, return that card under your control with a final with finality counter on it. I can't even get through the card. <laughs> okay, so this is going to cost six mana to pick up a creature off of, and you have to sacrifice a creature. <laughs> so it's not it's not like the Meat Hook Massacre where it's like this ridiculous sweeper that scales into the late game and gains a bunch of life and does a bunch of damage and whatever. But a lot like the first Meat Hook Massacre, you can choose to pay zero for X and it's actually still a pretty backbreaking card. Not just backbreaking, actually, it'll rip your freaking spine out, dude. Like this card's awesome. If you lose a creature, you can just get it back. Well, you've got life to pay. Go for the throat doesn't matter. <laughs> I think that's great, man. Even if like your opponent sweeps the board, now they have to be really, really careful because if they have any creatures on their side of the table, you're probably going to get them unless they want to pay some life. And if you pay any life, you'll get your best creatures back. So this is sweeper protection while also making sure that all of, you know, it, it makes all of your removal spells incredible. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it makes your own sweepers, your own deadly cover-ups great. And they actually play on curve with one another if you do want to pay zero for this meat hook. But scaling late into the game, if you happen to have eight mana, it's even better, you know? And there have been plenty of times on the arena the last couple of years where I would have had eight mana to pump into this card. But whether you have four, six, eight, ten, whatever, the card's going to do some really, really cool stuff for you. And you can set up some funky tricks of your own starting on the next turn curve wise so i don't think this is going to kill quite as many creatures as the original meat hook did but i still think that in this case the sequel might not be as good as the original but definitely has aspects apart from the original that i really enjoyed it's like the blair witch project i actually really kind of don't care for the blair witch project the original i, I think that blair witch is 
kind of not great. I respect what they were able to do with a single camera and some actors doing mostly improv. I, I like the process involved, but I don't really love the end product and I don't think it's very scary. However, I really like the Blair Witch Project 2 Book of Shadows. It's bad. It's not a good movie uh, whatsoever, but I think it's worth watching if you've never really seen it before or if you saw it thinking it was going to be another Blair Witch and you hated it. Go back and watch it again. Watch it as its own horror movie. I actually think that it's phenomenal. I really do. It's hilarious. Anyway, yeah, watch Book of Shadows. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. It's a fun movie. It's a very fun movie. Uh, there's more magic cards today, though. For instance, we got to do this Ghostbusters reference for some reason. This is Ghost Vacuum here. A single mana for an artifact. You can tap it and exile a card from a graveyard. But you can also pay six mana, tap it, and sacrifice it to put each creature exiled with Ghost Vacuum onto the battlefield under your control with a flying counter on it. Each of them is a 1-1 spirit in addition to its other types. Activate only as a sorcery. Man, when I was a kid, I was, uh, this is how old I am, by the way, I'm dating myself a little bit, but I had the whole setup, man, the proton pack toy that you actually sling over your back and like the, the gun that had like a big foam, like a yellow foam thing sticking out of it. You go, woo, like you're one of the Ghostbusters and the little box on the ground that you like step on the button and the box opens up. I had that whole setup and I think I sold it at a yard sale. If I still had it, I would be very happy and partially rich. And also I could use it for this part of the video, but I don't still have it. Those were the days, man. Weren't, wasn't being a kid great, but this is a reference to that. Also happens to be a very good magic card, I think. Just a one mana artifact that allows you to just like snipe stuff out of graveyards. And then eventually if your opponent doesn't break it, you get all them guys. Like they're all just one ones, but like maybe you get ETB triggers. They do fly. So even if you're paying six mana to get like three or four one one flyers, it's actually okay. You know, it's not, it's not a bad rate whatsoever, especially if you're able to like clean up the board with sweepers and removal and stuff like that. Use this like once every turn or two, you know what I mean? And then eventually late in the game, when all hope is lost for your opponent, their side of the board is clear. You got a bunch of open mana. Here's six one, one flyers. Deal with that. You can't. Okay. I guess you lose the game. I actually think this is, um, really, really good. And I've seen like almost no one talk about it today in standard right now. You're going to have like you know, no limit to the amount of targets this can hit in graveyards. You know, there's going to be plenty of decks that pay you off just for playing an artifact. There's going to be plenty of like control decks that want this in their sideboard for obvious reasons, whether they don't want their opponents to reanimate creatures or, Hey, maybe you want that attracts as enter the battlefield trigger. You know what I'm saying? So like this looks uh great. It, it costs as little as it could possibly. Well, I guess it could cost zero technically, but like it costs basically as little as it could possibly cost. And it literally any deck can play it as well. It just looks like a phenomenal sideboard piece that kind of breaks the conventions of what these sideboard pieces are supposed to look like. Turns the tables on your opponents, you know, makes it so that like all their reanimatable dudes with crazy ETB triggers are now going to be the worst thing that ever happened to them. <laughs> you know, so I don't know, man. I just wish I saw more people talking about this card. I don't know if it's a sleep or not, but I do think that it's a very well-designed, goofy little magic card that's actually extremely powerful on some levels, too. I know six mana is a lot, but you're kind of paying six mana to win the game if you do it right. Oh, and by the way, yes, I'm aware that you can target your own graveyard with it. I see people where if I don't say every little thing there is to say about a card, people assume that I missed it, and yes, I know this the whole time I've been using your opponent's graveyard as an example, but yeah, you can drop stuff into your own yard and then just exile it with this, and then later... You get a 1 1 Atali and a 1 1 Atraxa and a 1 1 whatever you're trying to do. So, like that, I guess that's good too. I guess. But there's there's one more card that we got to talk about today, at least that I've seen. Maybe they'll upload one before we end the video. But there's another cycle of dual lands. You guys remember how the other day we had a cycle of dual lands at Common? The Shadow Duels, whatever we ended up calling them. You know what I mean? Like they want you to have 13 life. If a player has 13 life or less, they come into play untapped. Otherwise, they come into play tapped. Those are really good. Those are like. Popper playable. I think they're like some of the better dual lands at common that we've ever seen. But today we got some rare duels and these look f fantastic. People used to watch my videos just for the way I said fantastic. I would get comments on it, like four comments a video. Like, man, I love the way this guy says fantastic. And now I kind of try to stay away from it, to be honest. But I think I'm going to reclaim it. I think I'm going to come back to fantastic. 
<laughs> these truly, there's just no other real word to describe them. There's many, just any superlative would do it. But Fantastic's a good one, man. Let's look at these duels here. We got to see five of them, all allied colors, and all of them care about having basic land types in play. I'm just going to pick one and kind of read from there. Blaze Meyer Verge, it's right there in the middle of my page on Mythic Spoiler. This is the black-red one, right? So in this case, it taps for black all the time and enters the play untapped. That's pretty good, just in and of itself. But it also taps for red, but you can only activate that if you control a swamp or a mountain. So it's kind of like the tainted lands from back in the day that wanted you to have swamps in play, right? But this also counts mountains. However, there's also the green-white one, right? This one always taps for green, but it can tap for white if you have a forest or a plains. But somebody kind of compared these to uh, pathways from the Kaldheim sets, and I think these are just like much better even than pathways were. And pathways were very, very good. Any effective dual land that comes into play untapped is more or less going to be good no matter what. But, you know, this is always going to produce at least the one color of mana no matter what you need from it. But being able to produce the other color so easily is gonzo, baby. Like, there's any manner of, you know, land ramp and standard right now from stuff like heaped harvest that people are already playing to overlord of the haunt woods by the by uh, which is coming out in this set and the moment it enters play on turn three you get a land that's every basic land type and turns on every single one of these lands which i think is a pretty hot interaction not to mention that these could end up in like three color decks man because we've also got like the surveil lands right now and those are like two different basic land types so don't think that these are meant for just two color decks i think that there's plenty of ways to make these work in three color decks especially especially in formats where we have triomes that have like three different, you know, land types, right? So these could work really easily with those. And if we ever get them back, remember that we have these, man. I'm pretty sure it's going to be hard to forget because they're going to be in a bunch of decks, man. Like these are the rare dual land too that can go into both aggro decks and slot in like perfectly fine, but also go into control and mid-range decks really easily too. Like especially with a card like Fabled Passage in the format right now. Turn one, pop my Fabled Passage. Turn two, this is just an untapped dual land, like basically no matter what. Card is phenomenal, dude. Like all of these are very, very good. I had somebody on Twitter be like, Okay, you're going to have to explain to me why these are good. And I hope that I've kind of done that over the last three or four minutes. I've been gushing about them because these are going to be some of the... I actually have a feeling, guys, that these are some of the better duels that we've ever seen. <laughs> You know, all it requires is a basic land, one of two different basic land types. It's not either, you know, or it's not both. You don't have to have both. <laughs> you have to have either one in play. And that's so easy, bro. Like, it's incredibly easy to do that. So just turn one, tap surveil land, turn two, this. In older formats, turn one, actual dual land that has two basic land types, turn two, one of these. I mean, these are, I'm telling you, dude, these will see play like way, 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 way back. In terms of formats, these might see play as far back as like Vintage or Legacy, but I think they've at least got a shot in Modern, mostly because fetch lands are so important in that set, so or in that format. So again, just fetch land whatever basic land type you need up on turn one or on turn two. This is just a fully enabled untapped dual land that you don't have to shock yourself for or anything. That is righteous, man. Like These are unbelievably good, and I will stake my YouTube career on that. Because it's just a super easy call. Seriously, like, these are some of the best duels ever conceived fairly easily. You know, maybe three and four color decks that play a ton of non-basics don't want them. But again, even in three and four color decks, it's not hard to envision a world where you just use fetch lands to enable these very easily. So I love them, man. I think there's some of the better duels printed in a very, very, very long time. But that's it. We just did our little reload there on Mythic Spoiler and I, I came up with nothing. So all I really want to impress on you is that those new duels are probably the best cards in the set. They're probably the best, most relevant cards that we'll see in this entire set. And I know that it's boring at this point in magic history and how good are dual lands really? Can they even print good dual lands anymore? Well, I think that they, you know, they've shown that they can print new, good, relevant dual lands um, that don't come into play tapped or do something funky or whatever. Like these are actually really, really well designed. And I think they're going to have this massive impact on, again, multiple formats. But apart from that, we got to see a lot of really good stuff today. Even in just like the common and uncommon slot, they were really relevant cards. It's standard day, everybody. So let me know how you felt about it. This is probably going to be the longest video of previous season so far because I had so much to say about so many of these cards. But I think it all deserves to be said, man. Duskmorn is looking out 
if, if the rest of previous season is anything like today, Dustmorn is looking to be a very good set. Like just today, we got like 15 cards for the top 25. How am I going to make that work? <laughs> I don't know. We're going to have to cut some stuff, man. But just let me know if you're not feeling it quite as much as I'm feeling it. You know, I really like the flavor of this set. We've already had a little bit of this discussion, but I just really like like the whole vibe of this set, the theme of this set. I know not everybody vibes with it, but... Even if you don't love the theme of the set, you have to start admitting at this point that there are some pretty powerful bangers in this thing. So let me know what you're excited to play with and do all the YouTube stuff on your way out. You know, like the video, sub to the sandwich, trying to get some more subs. They're delicious. You can check out the Patreon, just a dollar a month to support me. And it supports me more than you can imagine. Just a buck. If like, you know, even 1% of the people watching this video gave a dollar on Patreon, I would be doing a lot better. And honestly, uh, you know, could be doing worse. Could be doing a lot better, though. <laughs> anyway, that's about all I've got for this one. Just check us out on, I guess, Twitch. I should plug Twitch, right? We do Twitch and at least one day this week, Thursday night, around 8 p.m. EST. We're going to be doing this live on Twitch. It's going to be spoiler time on the twitch.com. TV. Dot TV. Anyway, that's all I've got, guys. <laughs> you probably clicked away anyway at this point because I'm done talking about cards. But in case you're still here, thanks for being here. I just appreciate the watch time and the fact that you refuse to leave until I am done talking, which I think I more or less am at this point. I'm dead from the place. <laughs> Thanks for watching, Wizards. Spread love and be kind.